Hey everyone, I'm Doug Black with Inside HPC. And today at Argonne National Lab, we have with us Rick Stevens. He is Associate Laboratory Director at Argonne and also an Argonne Distinguished Fellow. And we have Mike Papka, who is the Deputy Associate Lab Director, and he's the Director of the Argonne Leadership Com uh, Computing Facility. So gentlemen, welcome. Nice to be here, Doug. Okay, so uh, I was visiting at, at uh, ALCS, ALCF earlier this week, and um, fascinating time. Took a tour and saw Aurora, the exascale system um, now being installed at Argonne. And we'd be very interested in just an update on how the installation is going. We know that uh, in September, it was pretty big news that Intel was shipping Aurora blades made up of Sapphire Rapids and Ponte Vecchio GPUs. Um, and there seems to be an increasing optimism and sense of really good forward progress on Aurora. So Rick, if you could give us an update on where all that stands. Well, it's, it, what you said is true. I mean, Intel is shipping nodes every day. We're getting uh, node blades in, uh, we're getting them installed. Uh, we have all the network in the system. Uh, there's testing going on at multiple scales uh, for our uh, our test and development system, which is a two rack uh, system with about uh, 768 GPUs in it. That's uh, called Sunspot. That system is is up and running, and hopefully will be open to users uh, actually starting on Monday. Um, so the system is progressing. We've got uh, a large number of node boards already installed, and and more uh, in the pipeline. Um, the team is uh, on the floor. A you know, large number of, of engineers from both Intel and HPE are uh, working, uh, you know, building building the system. It'll take us months to do it, but uh, it's it's moving quite well ahead. Uh, Mike, looking at um, the facility from the outside, what struck me is that you haven't added a computer room. You've really added a computer building for Aurora. Is that an exaggeration, would you say? <laughs> no, I, I, that's absolutely correct, right? So we basically doubled our, our floor space um, for the machine. And, and it, it was opportunistic. Uh, because of the scale of Aurora, uh, we really took advantage of, of a new building to house it. And that allowed us to do some huge optimizations. All the electrical switchgear transformers are directly above it. And that allows us to efficiently connect connect to the to the system so no you're absolutely correct we very much built out a new machine room taking down the wall between our old one and the new one so they're seamless but added that to, to, to house aurora and can you either one of you um kind of give us an updated timeline of how you see this all playing out maybe over the next six to 12 months as far as installation and moving toward testing well, as you know, the, when you're building big systems, you have several stages you have to go through, right? You have to get the physical infrastructure in, you have to get the racks in, you've got to get the racks populated, you've got to get networking in, you've got to get it all debugged. And then you start a series of, of formal tests, right, with the vendor, uh, functional tests and stability tests um, that ultimately get to the point where you can accept the machine, pay for the machine, and and open it up to users. Now with Aurora, we're doing something slightly different because we're trying to enable progress on the exascale computing project applications and, and uh, co-design efforts. We're actually opening up, uh, we tend to open up the machine kind of in parallel as we would normally be doing the acceptance tests and the stability tests so that uh, users from our uh, early science program at Argonne um, uh, from the LCS Early Science Program and ECP will actually be on the machine uh, doing experiments, doing computational runs, doing test shots and so on in parallel while we're actually uh, doing the stability and, and acceptance testing. So that's a, a new way to do it, but um, there's been a lot of uh, optimism uh, uh, so far that the, these two efforts can be kind of done at the same time. And, and when would... Where would you say we'll be in a year? Will, will the system be end user ready or will we'll still be in the testing phase? We, we hope that we will be close to, to end user uh, 
ready, ready uh, by this time next year. I mean, there will be end users on the machine, you know, maybe not remote distant users from ECP, but there'll be users on the machine earlier this spring. Um, but we hope to put it into production as early as possible. Okay. And just looking at Frontier, which we have visited and covered quite a bit uh, compared to Aurora, is it, you know, and we've certainly seen the architectural differences. There seems, you know, each node has, Aurora has, um, it's a different mix of GPU, CPU compared yeah. to Frontier. Is that, does that result in a qualitative difference in maybe workload appropriateness for one system over the other or different characteristics? Oh, it might. I think it's a little bit early to, to tell um, how the two systems will compare. I mean, the, you know, the, the GPU designs are quite different. The uh, ratio of GPUs and CPUs is different. The number of endpoints connecting each node is different. The software stacks, uh, you know, from the vendor are different. So we don't actually know. <laughs> um, we, of course, have goals that are in the contracts, and we have goals that we've been working on with the community for the last couple of years that uh, make the two machines both true exascale machines. They make them uh, super interesting for all the applications that are in the ECP portfolio and for early science portfolio and for the community's portfolio. So we think they're going to be really great platforms, but they will behave differently for some applications. And I think it's going to be a lot of empirical uh, work to determine, you know, which machine is better for which class of applications. You could, you might get some hint from that from looking at the detailed specs of the GPUs, and maybe looking at the memory specs of the systems and so on. But I think we'll we'll really need some actual on the you know on the ground experience with the hardware. One thing that Aurora will have uh, when it's in its final configuration is uh, the x86 CPUs will have high bandwidth memory. And that is a, a distinct difference from on the two machines. Um, so that's one thing that's different. Uh, the file system organization is a bit different. The I/O structures are different. Um, you know, we have the Intel's Deos uh, infrastructure in, in Aurora, so that's a unique um, you know capability that's different from from Frontier. Um, so we'll see. I, I think the the yeah, you know, the strength of the way DOE did this was to have two sites that are standing up machines that are, you know, both different from each other, but also trying to leverage as much common infrastructure as possible. Mm. Okay. And um, certainly um, we've seen just an explosion, maybe a Cambrian explosion of, of chips, uh, chip options over the last 10 years. Um, and certainly we're seeing more and more hybrid, you know, mixed systems, G CPU, GPU, but also moving toward the the AI uh, chips like Cerebrus. Um, very interesting to see at at Argon the AI testbed, which, as I understand it, is one of your methods for evaluating um, this variety of chips and figuring out what will do what and where where they're best put to to good use. Do I have that right, Mike? Yeah, I, I mean, I think as we look towards the future, we're already seeing that the systems are extremely heterogeneity. You know, there's a lot of heterogeneity to them. And um, while we're impressed with the, the CPUs and GPUs that we have and what the market's done, you know, we're seeing an increasing uh, demand on our, from our workload of in the AI space and trying to understand what's happening in the community right now is key. And so when we started down the path of the AI testbed, it was really to look at what each of these chips had to offer to science. And then as we start to scale them out, put them together to, to work collectively on a problem, how does that work? And we're already seeing with um, our Gordon Bell finalist uh, application tying the existing CPU, GPU, infrastructure with with these accelerators uh, to do exciting things. So very much the direction we're looking in. Yeah, it was interesting today talking with Addison Snell and Earl Joseph, two of our leading industry analysts, Hyperion Research and at, at Intersect 360. They both said one of the big challenges that's emerged in HPC is this variety of architectures and chips and what how, how can end users understand how to best use them. So 
very interesting. The um, the next thing is, you know, if exascale, and Rick, maybe I've got this wrong, maybe has reached a culmination point of the general purpose cluster. The, the document that came out in late June, the RFI for the next generation of leadership systems seems to be a different kind of a thing. Could you could you kind of uh, delve into that a little bit? Yeah, well, of course, we're we're still very interested in where the existing community is going. I mean, the, the mainstream uh, makers, right? Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, IBM, and so on, HP. Um, but we're also seeing, because of a rich uh, investment in startups, you know, whether it's AI startups or non or new um, CPU architecture type startups, a sense that there's, um, you know, maybe more so than in the recent past, right? There's more options on the table, uh, or, or these groups trying to uh, push the envelope on what might be possible in, in various ways, and. We also see, of course, a huge progress in cloud computing and uh, you know, lots of potential applications for how cloud uh, computing infrastructures might complement our on-premise you know, large-scale systems, uh, whether it's for edge computing or for uh, you know, elasticity or so on. And we're also seeing progress in quantum uh, hardware, lots of uh, companies uh, working on quantum hardware. And of course, the, the goal for the DOE um, centers um, is to understand what uh, mix of technologies will best serve the DOE mission, right? In the in the science and discovery missions, and national security missions, and energy missions, and so that means that we not only have to have test beds uh, for evaluating things, like we have the AI test bed, Oak Ridge is doing some quantum test beds, um, uh, other labs are doing other kinds of test beds, um, but to um, cast a very broad net when we're thinking about how we're going to do procurements in the future to get um, many voices into that conversation with as many different ideas as possible and, and try to work out um, what areas uh, might be suitable for investment uh, to drive the technology closer to where we could deploy it in large scale systems but also how would we build such systems? And if we like the technology that might be coming out of different uh, places, um, how would we uh, cause systems to get designed that integrate that technology into a coherent infrastructure? Um, and how would we stand up software stacks and, and basically turn, turn the technology into actual usable systems? So this recent RFI was aimed at uh, you know sampling the, the conversation out there and um, we'll be following up in December with some more interactions with the uh, large number of vendors that responded uh, to try to prioritize common research areas that um, the DOE might consider for investing. And um, that information will also be used to drive where the labs are going to do procurements in the next couple of years. So that's the that's the story behind the RFI. Um, we've, we've done it, you know, kind of like this way in the past, but I think what's different is uh, it's a lot... Um, you know, it's a a la carte menu in some sense, and the and the menu is really big uh, compared to what it was say ten years ago. The last time we we did a, a turn through this, um, I think we did make some observations that um, you know we have a lot of technology providers and relatively fewer uh, integration partners. I think that's going to be a challenge, um, and. Uh, We've also got some technologies that are still quite immature. And one of the things that we're trying to figure out is when will those uh, immature technologies maybe mature, like in the case of quantum, to where it might become uh, something that uh, end users can get value out of. But also, um, how would we lower the barriers to integrate new technologies into large scale systems? So those are some of the questions that we're trying to address with the RFI. Yeah, and I guess a, a point of departure here would be as you were telling me the other day at the lab, a, a backbone, if you will, a backplane into which these technologies can be, I think of it as plugging in. Yeah, I mean, if we had, if, if we, we imagine <laughs> that it might be possible to have systems where there's a uh, you know, backbone or we want to call it a backplane that has power, cooling, maybe communications, is designed in a way that, um, could last maybe a decade and that you could have modules that uh, get installed into that infrastructure that, you know, draw on power, they plug into some, you know, liquid cooling option or something, or they, and they plug into optics say, 
and uh, you can uh, those modules might be um, something that you could integrate and and replace and and evolve forward over time, uh, maybe faster than we normally would would uh, replace machines, but also allow us to plug in different kinds of options, right? So this is another way of thinking about heterogeneity. Uh, it also could help us uh, understand whether disaggregated architectures are the way forward or whether or not, um, you know, different ways of building machines. And maybe it, it would lead to a different way of even doing the physical integrations. So these are some of the things that we're opening up. But it's kind of a once in a generation kind of opportunity to to decide if this is something different is possible. Um, we, we don't know. We'll have to see how aggressive or interested the vendors are in uh, in trying something different. But we have an opportunity to, to ask those questions. Yeah, the, I guess what maybe my point of confusion was when I saw more modular, less monolithic. I, but we're still talking about mammoth systems. Each one at each lab would be uh, we're, we're the, larger than the current exascale. System. Yeah, we're you know we're deep. You know we're going to be in the next procurement cycle deeply into the post exascale yeah. you know regime, right? So we're talking about machines that are going to be you know many exaflops um, in various precisions and have big footprints and and uh, yeah. So this is not uh, not just about small experiments, but how do we understand how to build? big systems differently. I think that's the opportunity. I think a key thing that Rick's saying there is that it's an experiment. So right now the machines are very, you know, we procure them. It's a multi-year build out and we have a very slow rate of injection of new technology into these systems. And I think one of the things that we want to see going forward is how does the, the resource itself become more of an experiment while at the same time delivering a stable platform to the to the computational community um, and it, it, it's exciting opportunities there yeah I think it's a fascinating strategy in, in, including the idea that you can bring in more vendors there's there could be a, a greater ecosystem of vendors that, that that might be able to take part in these leadership systems I think that's part of it it also could mean that we accelerate the injection of new technology so that from from invention to scale up is a shorter time frame excellent okay and actually Doug that's exactly what we're doing with the AI test bed we start off with the chip and then we kind of keep building out and as we see that it scales trying to accelerate that 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 timeline as opposed to multi years to multi months nice very good. All right, gentlemen, uh, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. We've been with Rick Stevens and Mike Papka at Argonne. Thanks so much. Thanks.